Yeah, good point. It's a balance. Yeah. If they can't so, just come out and go, do you know what we don't give? You know, you know, Bird like a a, has a powered site in Birmingham now. It's entirely powered by human waste. I think. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They they talked about it over dinner recently, which is quite so they, a great, so a great, fantastic, a great time. evening to bring so, it up. So they do dinner. give it, and they they literally give it. Is a site in Birmingham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get your beeper out. Yeah. Someone else did. <laughs> <laughs> What's it called? It's like uh, oh, there's a there's a proper word for it. It's not powered, but that's basically uh, what it is. Yeah. Oh really? It's not. That's yeah. not the word. Yeah. <laughs> I, saw the, I saw the expression they use in the, Bio. In the corporate sustainability <laughs> report. <laughs>
light-hearted stuff going up on stage. Thanks. And there was the usual um, sort of quite extensive audience interaction, which I thought was quite good. I like it when they all start turning around and having a go at each other. That, about that's what's interesting stuff. about this conference is after a while, the programming sort of gets taken over by the uh, the opinions in the audience. And after, you know, in the last session of the day, on the first day, we, all, uh, we did this last year to great success. We did it again just a few minutes ago. And uh, we just turned it over to them and said, okay, yeah. so what do you guys want to talk about? And sure enough, hands go up. As soon as some guy says something, then some other operator disagrees with him, and it, you know, and it's it's all in. The, yeah. the thing, one thing interests me is it gets quite sort of arcane and sort of inside baseball quite quickly. Yeah, yeah. It's, you can tell there's little f things that that are certainly lost on me as as a sort of generalist. There's little sort of niggly industry things that come to the surface so quickly they must be sort of bubbling under the whole time. Well, and what's weird is the the yeah they're arguing over you know the. the all the problems boil down are come down to the industry is uh, really just it, it's sort of the legacy uh, networks and technologies just weigh it down, yeah. hold it back. It it causes all kinds of confusion as to when to adopt new technologies and also when to get rid of old technologies. You know, are we letting go of revenue that yeah. we should be holding on to? Are we not moving quickly enough because this stuff won't integrate with our old stuff? We should hold on to that thought because I reckon yeah. that's going to come up when we chat yeah. about um, Ian's cunning plan okay. segment. But um, you guys also did a bit of research. You sort of polled presumably yeah. light reading audience. So we, we polled a light reading online audience. Um, we did it in 2018. We did it again this year. And uh, it's just to kick off the conference and give us some conversation topics. Yeah. So it's not not scientific. We don't we, yeah. we don't poll the exact same people. We just poll our general audience. And then we poll the room, uh, you know, with uh, we have these little uh, yeah, paddles. Thumbs up, we should thumbs we should bring paddles. some paddles as props for this. But uh, we uh, yeah, it's a good good idea. <laughs> 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 but uh, we uh, you know, we ask the audience what they think of some broader telecom issues and they give us you know a yes or no type of answer or or an open open ended answer um, one of the interesting ones that came up this past time was should telcos own media companies mm. um, so last year uh, the overwhelming majority said yes telcos should own media companies this year it completely flipped yeah in the space of one year so because they've seen how badly things have gone for AT and T. I think so. I think well, that was one of that was one of the comments from the audience. That seems to be the general consensus is that that AT and T seem to have uh, they haven't had time to prove out the yeah. the model. Yeah, because that was one thing I was going to yeah. say. I mean, you say you see how badly it's gone. Isn't it really hard to tell whether it's gone it's well or badly? Tell. Yeah, I suppose it's hard to tell. But there's lots of maybe it's just what a massive about hassle it, it is. in the last year. I suppose about the sense of doing. Well, it. and there's also there's a lot of you know there's there's a lot of. Um, a consternation in the creative community about uh, telco executives, you know, creatives reporting to telco executives because all they're interested in is yeah. cost savings and optimization, whereas creative industries are more about. And you could just see it a mile spending. off, couldn't you? Yeah. As soon as they started, I remember reporting on it each time they've done a reorg of the, what they call it, um, AT and T Media or something yeah, like that yeah. now. Every time, clash. yeah, every time they've done a reorg and they got rid of the head of HBO and they got rid of the head of this, that, and the other, and someone who's creative, someone who's journalistic, whatever, and stuck in some, some AT&T lifer. Yeah. You sort of think, and I'm sure that lifer, you know, is a very competent person. I'm sure they got to the top because they're good at what they do, but that doesn't mean they're good at this stuff. It's just a, it, it's a, it's a really tough industry to understand. And I think one of the, the things that also scared people right away was there were a lot of people at HBO and some of the other uh, uh, media properties that it, that it's sort of, that Time Warner's affiliated with, or Warner Media is affiliated with, that it's um, you know that left at, as soon as the merger closed, mm. and that scared everybody in the creative community because they were like, oh, and and to to be fair to AT and T, some of those people who were leaving, it had nothing to do. They just saw that as a as a good exit point, you know, to get on with other things in their career, you know, open their own production shop, do whatever. Some of them were driven by the change in management and reporting structure. And it really is too soon to tell. I mean, in terms of media, 
you know, any media company that has its own distribution, it, it can be advantageous. It can help them out. And, well, that's you know, part of the pitch. Yeah. The whole... okay. But, but at and not made it happen yet. That's the interesting thing is they've only confused people with the marketing and the branding's been so bad. It's, it's unspeakably bad. Is it? So like you're the, you're the only one of us who's based in the U S what kind of messaging you're getting as a consumer? So the really weird thing is they, they, um, you know, they pushed us off UVerse, which was their blended, uh, you know, broadband and, and TV product. They pushed us off of that to direct TV. Um, a couple of years on direct TV, and then all of a sudden we start getting pounded with direct TV now. Oh, you need to go to this over the top thing. It's just like your satellite package, except you can get it over the top. Mm-hmm. And if you were a UVerse customer, you were like, yeah, I was doing that five years ago, and then you pushed me to satellite because of uh. the pricing. Um, the pricing was, you know, the, the big argument for that thing. So they hung a satellite on everybody's house, and then they told them, oh, that's that's yeah. not the thing so anymore. Passe. Well, you're we're, so lame having We're going back to the Internet thing we were doing five years ago, right. except we're calling it something different, and you can get it on all your devices. It, yeah. it, it's really frustrating. So for from the consumer point of view, I mean, I went to over-the-top media. Um, I went to YouTube TV, and they're very simple. They're like, here's the package. Uh, one price, take it or leave it. Get What's it. You, is that something that's unique to the States, YouTube TV? Uh, I don't know if they're doing it internationally. Yeah, it's but I mean, is this something it's... where you're presumably not just regular YouTubers? Yeah, it's, a... it's, it's basically a replication of your pay TV channels. You I know, see. All your locals, all your uh, things. I think we do get something as comprehensive as that through YouTube here, do we? YouTube TV. Yeah. And then they have, they have a, channels with yeah yeah. yeah they have but a, this a, sounds quite comprehensive. Cloud DVR thing that as soon as you uh, as soon as you tell it what it, what you want to record, it's driven by the user experience, which is kind of hokey to say, but it really is um, it, it really is incredibly good compared to what traditional pay TV is like. So right. your live television, if you like football, you just tell it I want to follow football, and then it just records all the games for you, and you know puts them in a place where you can go back and find them at. Your leisure. Well, what about services um, being available on other platforms and to other, you know, non AT and T? Because I know that was one of the concerns I think about the deal in the first place that they might try and restrict content to Verizon customers, for instance. Well, but has there been any development in that area? There hasn't all? been on the HBO side of the the thing. So you know, the one AT and T's uh, over the top television thing called AT and T TV, it it hasn't really taken off. They've actually had you know a bunch of people join and then leave. Because the channel offering was um, was was not that not that interesting, they couldn't get all the networks to play ball. Part of the problem with that, though, is more of the competitive dynamic of the rest of the industry. So obviously, Disney's doing its own thing, uh, Comcast, NBC's doing its own thing, and so on. So Apple, it's kind of yeah, yeah, Apple's. So it, it's it's partly because they weren't, um, you know, no one wanted to support the new distribution platform. Um, and then the, the other part of it is, that to be fair to AT&T, they never, as far as I know, they never restricted anything on any other platform, but it was a concern because, you know, they're an operator and they had, um, you know, were bragging about the fact that they could, um, you know, that the reason for the media company merger was so they could reach this huge audience, you know, with mm. their mobile and their broadband subscribers. The interesting thing is they would have fared better, I think, if they had not played that up and had just run the company well and yeah you know benefited from the association i guess but then they had to justify the, the ridiculous outlay to sort of right yeah. isn't a lot of it based on sort of advertising opportunities being able to that's this, yeah this that's where at and is probably going to make up the ground is that they are um they have a sort of separate advertising subsidiary that's apparently going to be able to stitch together um, all of these different consumer profiles and make sure that no matter what AT&T platform you're using, they have some way of knowing what your preferences are, what your viewing habits are, your mobility tendencies, and that sort of thing. And it, like all of these things, uh, including over-the-top providers, it's all about data collection. If they can collect enough data on enough people, that's really enticing to advertisers, especially when they can um, sell them on intent mm. uh, you know, and sort of say, hey, we figured out by our research that if a customer does this and this, they the next thing they're going to yeah. do is buy this. As opposed to current Google or Facebook algorithms that serve me up an ad for something on Amazon I just bought. Right. <laughs> exactly. oh, I can't believe how unsophisticated those things still are. Um, right. So so if we, and, and, and correct me if I missed any out, if we say the three main sort of reasons or stated reasons for AT&T buying Time Warner are the advertising you just spoke about, yeah. 
um, the uh, the standalone, you know, the, the, the profit center that those that those set of companies are by themselves. Yeah. And then thirdly, I suppose the sort of bundling um, subscriber stickiness type of thing. The bundling and distribution. In, in that order, are we saying that we think that the longer term um, sell is, is on the advertising more than the other two? I think they stand a better chance on the advertising side. I think they can get better data from all those properties that, that touch consumers in some way um, or reach consumers in some way. Touching is kind of weird. Um, <laughs> but uh, they can get in better. This day and age. Yeah, no. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> they can get better data with all of that than, and, and, and be more profitable, I think, in that area um, because it's sort of a sustainable thing. Um, you know, the data sets are always going to be changing and getting more sophisticated. And since they have reach on the content side, on the device side, on the broadband side, they have, you know, again, the ability to provide advertisers with a really interesting uh, data set on their subscribers and on their consumers. Can they put that together in the right way? I, I don't yeah. know. It's still too early to tell, but I think that's a more compelling well, one thing. One thing that just occurs to me, well, well, it still remains to be seen whether they're going to make an overwhelming success of it. The other um, largest operator group in the U.S., Verizon, I think it's provably its media M&A strategy has failed because I think it's trying to, it's got, you know, it rebranded all these things like Yahoo and AOL, which yeah. seemed like a dodgy idea at the time. And like, I, I know what, yeah. let's buy 90s internet yeah. brands. <laughs> um, and then, you know, but there were, there were more, there were obviously newer brands within that, like the AOL bit had things like Huffington Post and yeah. TechCrunch and all that sort of thing. But they seem to be looking to flog a lot of that stuff now. Yeah. And I think it's hard, I think. I, I would say with a degree of confidence that that particular strategy, which, which looked pretty shit to start with, to be honest, but I think we can mark that down as failed. Maybe that's one of the reasons you observed this swing in your in your research. What do you think? It could be too, yeah, because I, you know, that one of the biggest stories about Verizon's acquisition spree was how quickly they got rid of stuff. You know, they sold Flickr, they sold Tumblr, they, mm. you know, they 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 started having a fire sale on those '90s brands almost as soon as. Yeah, you know they got so what, them in house. What, what did they want? Was it well, like Huffington Post and uh, yeah, Post? Was that I, don't, I don't know. I don't know why you would, uh, you know. I mean, Huffington Post was the, the the banner. Yeah, yeah, that was their, their sort of in, lead, within AOL. Yeah, within AOL, and then they bought the whole AOL. You know, Verizon bought the whole AOL group. But I think I think the whole, I think the whole thing was consumer acquisition. You know, customer acquisition. Like right. they, just like AT and T, they had a strategy for pairing these data sets together and going okay. How many of these customers are actually our customers that we can reach by phone, and then we can tell you what they're reading, and you know, um, sort of observe what their intent is, or what they're worried about, or whatever, and then sell them advertising on top of that. But Verizon changed strategies halfway through, and the net result of that is they started selling off those older yeah. brands. And um, I just I haven't really seen. Um, it pay off on the Verizon media side. I mean, they still do have a pretty big uh, interactive or media business, but I think that's more on the back of um, just being a good sort of agency, you know, at, at right. agency yeah. type Pure thing. Pure ad agency, and not play necessarily role owning the properties. Yeah, you know yeah. what I think is really weird about the, some of these survey results that come in today is, like, as you were saying, this um, the showing sort of people being quite up on the whole buying media properties, yeah. and yet they're really quite questionable moves. I think mm -hmm. looking at the mm. horizon, looking at the at t decision, and yet the same question got, got asked about banking, I think. Should operators become banks? And it just got destroyed. And yet, yeah. and yet MTS has made a real success of banking yeah. in Russia. And Orange is, you know, it's done pretty well as a sort of mobile money provider in yeah. Africa. So you can say, I mean, Ray was pointing out that it's not actually the same thing doing sort of transactions and payments, the kind of stuff that's been done in Africa as actually being a bank. But yeah. there's certainly a crossover there. And you can see with... You know, with its footprint of stores, there's an opportunity to get people in. They're used to sort of managing uh, relationships in that kind of way. It seems to me more like a sort of uh, natural fit for an operator wow. than to go and do something like owning the Huffington Post. And, and yeah. how many times have the telcos bored us with the story of, you know, uh, why should we succeed? You know, why should uh, telcos have an advantage over over the top providers? And they're like, well, we have this consumer relationship, this billing relationship that goes back years. Exactly. We're a trusted yeah. provider and yeah. blah, blah, blah. And it's like, really? And you couldn't just flip that into 
you know, payments or a bank yeah. or something like that? I mean, to me, to, ba- to me, banking or other sort of utility-like services, energy or something, seem much closer to what they should be doing than trying to own the Huffington Post or, mm. or, or creative businesses like... That's the tough um, part, though, is yeah, they, don't, so, they don't want to see themselves as utilities. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think anything that puts them in that bucket, they, they sort of shy away from. Yeah. They, and, yet, and yet, the further they stray from it, the further from their core competence they go. Yeah, they, they, they are they are out of their depth pretty quick on that stuff. But uh, but yeah, I think I think back to the utility stuff. I, I do think all the telcos should give some sort of payments or banking service a try because they they they've convinced us <laughs> they have the relationship, they have the billing mechanisms in the back end. Yeah. Maybe they need to be modernized, but they're going to modernize them anyway. So why not? Well, I I've got one more thing to say, which is a bit of a sort of self promotion on behalf of. Both telecoms.com and light reading. I'll allow it. But uh, yeah, I think so. I think we can allow that. <laughs> we've had a we've had a sip of wine, um, which is that as I was telling you, Phil, when we were chatting um, uh, offline, that the media business model is incredibly simple, which is yep. it, it's it's to sort of create and maintain and grow an audience and then monetize that audience. Mm-hmm. Um, increasingly, unfortunately, with their consent, thanks to things like GDPR. Oh, so it's not like the good old days. You right. Just do what you wanted with them. Um, and You're cutting this part out, right? <laughs> <laughs> good. good. And uh, and and we're doing all right. I, I did a bit of a bit further self promotion when we had telecoms.com awards. I stood up there with a little speech and I, I said a similar thing to this. I said telecoms.com's increased its traffic around about sort of fifty percent year on year. And I think it's just because me and Jamie and, and Way when he writes, we just write what we want. Yeah. We're not second guessing the audience. We're just writing stuff, uh, we're just being honest, being opinionated, having our style, and you guys have got your style, and you're honest, and you're opinionated, and you know what you're talking about. And and that's the only way. As soon as, soon as like, in our space, and I won't, you know, I'm not going to be so bitchy as to name them, but there have been other titles that have second-guessed the market and started doing, like, things like pay-to-play. Right. Where, where you start just writing puff pieces about advertisers to get cash off them, yeah. which which does solve short-term cash flow problems, but I sincerely believe isn't sustainable in the long term and i think and i think you know we're all sort of reaping the rewards of it and the reason i bring it up other than to blatantly self-promote um <laughs> is back to the back to what we we're talking about at the start with at&t owing owning sorry something incredibly creative like hbo mm-hmm. you know is hbo going to continue to produce game of thrones sopranos the wire all that sort of thing um, because if at&t second guesses i.e. they don't give the creatives free license. I mean, the amount of budget Game of Thrones has is just sick. Yeah. And granted, perhaps the last couple of seasons, the ROI wasn't there, but they're pretty healthy budgets. And it's pretty lavish. Even, one episode, they couldn't afford lights, apparently. Oh, well, they just ran out of cash? No, it was just it was in the dark. Oh, that dark one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a bit weird. I, I was a bit disturbed. I just got a new telly, and I was really proud of it. And <laughs> for some reason, the technology of my telly was really struggling with it. I thought, this telly... It's a long night. Yeah, anyway. But... Yeah, so I mean that that's the point I want to make, and 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 after this I'll ask you two before we move on, what our what our conclusion is about whether we think operators can be media owners. But that's my biggest reason for doubting it. Mm. It's not that there aren't synergies and all these other business yeah, buzzwords, yeah. but whether or not it's just too far from their sort of utility, whether they like it or not, DNA. You know, I can't think of a bigger difference between a utility and a creative mm. setup. Um, so that's my biggest reason for being skeptical about them succeeding. What about you? Uh, I just think any any attempt to integrate it at any level other than like sharing, you know, the same HR department and kind of IT department and kind of core corporate systems. I think any level to integrate is is not a good idea. I think they should run these businesses as separate things. They've been doing well with what they've done, and then like I said, they, you know, they can cut cost out of those shared systems. But, um, but and also provide an additional distribution mechanism and maybe bonus in, yeah. you know, subscribers for different packages and things of that sort. I mean, there, there's some, lovely synergies and yeah, economies there's some of scale and marketing stuff. wins they can have there and stuff like that. But I don't, I don't necessarily, other than that, I don't think it's a, on its face, it's, it's generally a good idea to go that far outside of your, your comfort zone unless you're going, unless you're comfortable enough managing it like almost like Berkshire Hathaway manages companies you know, right it just it but has just mattress like stores and jewelry stores yeah. and Dairy Queens and it just runs them and then and it checks in once a month make sure they haven't gone mad provides them common infrastructure yeah. but yeah it just keeps keeps the lights on and that sort of thing I, I think there's some sense in doing it that way um, the the other thing about the 
you know the the media company um, sort of and telco dynamic is that it it's it doesn't necessarily help them with with their core competitive problem which is the over the top market you know is is in one way experiencing a resurgence so it's like even if HBO is going to have creative problems. We probably won't know it for quite a while because in the very short term, they're going to have to spend to keep up with Disney and you know some of these other yeah. uh, sort of things. But when that goes away... Yeah, if anything, it's ramped up that, that, yeah. that arms race on spend. And what's the, what's the strategy long term? I mean, you know, that was the thing about what HBO... Before AT&T, HBO knew what it was, it knew what its value was, and it wasn't trying to grow as fast as a software company or whatever. It was just trying to be the best HBO it could be. Um, mm. it, it, I, I worry that under AT&T, that gets, that gets messed with. Yeah. Ian, do you think they can make a success of buying media companies? Um, I just think it's a really odd thing for them to go for. I, mean, I can see why they want to, because it's all superheroes and... You know, these executives are big kids, basically, aren't they? They like the idea oh. of being the, p- the person behind the latest events. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Do you think they're, do you think they're all little cosplay at the weekend? Well, they dress I just up? think it's very... It's the thing that everybody's <laughs> talking about in, in the office is the latest episode of yeah. Game of Thrones. Or, so maybe it's just a search for relevance. It's a search for relevance, but, but why flippant. target something that you've got two huge OTT companies doing a really good job of that, and now yeah. Apple's gone in there as well, and they spend billions a year on... You know, on, on programming. And you've got Amazon and as well. And the OTT players who we're always talking about the threat they pose to the telcos. The telcos think they can go and challenge them in that area, as opposed mm. to trying to do something like energy or banking, which is basically full of <laughs> providers who don't provide, you know, don't offer a very good service. Yeah, yeah. Where there's real opportunity for disruption. I don't, I just don't understand those survey results that came out today. It didn't make any sense to me at all, that. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, okay, so um, uh, moving on. So, yes. Um, I'd say this week one of the bigger stories that was just breaking yesterday and today was um, a partnership between AWS, Amazon Web Services and a bunch of operators to do with edge computing. Now, this is a little bit more this is a little bit more sort of geeky and arcane. So at this stage, after a bit of wine, I'm gonna try and focus here. Right. But but basically long and short of it is so the edge is sort of data centers that are like halfway between the massive data center that is in, you know, in some football sized, football field sized thing, and you and me sitting here right now. And the reason why we care about the edge, especially in the era of 5G, is uh, because it's physically closer to us. And that unlocks certain things, especially to do with low latency, which in turn, you know, I mean, I wrote about it recently. There's a thing I've taken a piss about over the years this sort of remote robotic surgery and all that sort of thing. But obviously, low latency, you know, it, would enable me to, like, for example, remote control um, uh, a drone right. with my phone. Uh, and the, the, po- the point about low latency is there can't be a delay. You know, if, I, if, I, if I'm looking at the screen, I can see a drone's about to fly into a building, I can't have a one second delay because that'd be too late. And there's all sorts of other uses of, of low latency live live it's streaming delivering missiles for the military apparently. oh yeah that was yeah. what Steve was chatting about. oh no we're not allowed to name anyone oh, sorry yeah. Steve Steve <laughs> Steve Stevenson Steve if that is his real name yes <laughs> um, like that channel house rule went, yeah that went, went, went right when are we the in the window. podcast yeah. <laughs> went right under the um, truck and uh, yeah and so that's all a really good idea but um, but now suddenly all these operators so this deal with AWS involved uh, Verizon, Vodafone, KDDI, and SK Telecom. And I guess the thing was, the well, discussion I was having um, was why are they letting someone like Amazon Web Services in? So AWS is the biggest public cloud provider. Right. But you figured that the, the edge was one place where operators can sort of steal back a bit of the sort of IT cloud stuff from the big cloud providers such as AWS, Microsoft, Azure, Google, etc., and yet suddenly now they're getting in bed with them, and so that's that seemed to be the the angle for me. And before I, I'll, I'll hand it to you first, Phil. But so my initial thought about this um, unholy alliance is it's basically an admission. It's slightly overlaps with the theme we were talking about before. An admission that. Certainly when it comes to dealing with um, developers and, and the people who are actually going to make the apps that make use of all this low latency, mobile edge computing stuff, 
that the operator is basically conceding that's not a core competence of theirs, and it is a core competence of public cloud providers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, within the public cloud, it isn't just, you know, here you are, here you can have some capacity, some metered capacity. There's all this extra ad value added stuff on top of that that they do, which is one of the reasons AWS has done so well. So they're basically going, look, they're kind of throwing in the towel, or they're just admitting early on that we've got to partner with these people rather than try and reinvent the wheel. So that, that was my initial take on it, but yeah, what do I, you reckon? I think it was it's smart from the point of view of if you look at the history of telcos in cloud, they tried to do the Amazon type cloud services. They tried to do public cloud and you know kind of business cloud services. And you know they they failed pretty quickly in the public cloud. You know they and 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 expensively. And you know the case of Verizon buying Terramark and some things like that, they they um, uh, couldn't provide uh, couldn't convince everyone that they were going to provide uh, basically cheap on demand supercomputing utility anywhere yeah. that people wanted. And Amazon's very good at 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 both doing it and convincing people that it can do it. I think they're really smart to partner with a cloud provider in the in the way that it sort of um, it, it heads off the, the the decision of you know should I buy this from AT and T or should I buy this from Amazon or should, or whoever, yeah. whoever the operator is and Amazon um, if they're partnered together then they'll both benefit and I think that's that that's really what what they're <coughs> after and I also think for the cloud providers it's kind of a uh, it's it's kind of a bonus because they need the they need to um, in, ensure some uh, some service level agreements across different geographies because none of these edge computing scenarios are local and stay local. They're going to be local. You playing a game, the game's based somewhere else, and it's multiplayer and massive and that sort of thing. And that mm. requires an awful lot of um, connectivity and 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 extremely low latency. And that's what the telcos know well. So, yeah. so it it is kind of a good it's kind marriage. of everyone playing to their strengths. In yeah, principle. yeah, and and also you know to credit the telcos, they're learning from their past mistakes. They're yeah, not I trying agree. to replicate. You know, the edge looked a little too much like the cloud. It's kind of nice for them to go. Okay, we'll build the edge out to this point, and then we'll partner with the cloud provider for all the other stuff we can't do. Yeah, what do you reckon to the AWS thing? Yeah, what Phil said. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got no, anything I mean, contrarian or grumpy to podcast. say? Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with Phil that it's like, it's kind of, their competence is owning the infrastructure, I guess, and the assets that you need for, you know, deploying Edge on the hardware side and the, you know, the Amazons can bring the kind of software expertise. So it's kind of a perfect marriage in that sense, each, each kind of party bringing what it does best. But I just sort of wonder in the long term how, you know, they've talked for a long time about the edge being potentially a big sales opportunity, and they can make a lot of money out of this. And yeah. you know, they're now allowed. They've now we now see deals taking place with Amazon, with Google. I think in some cases is also getting into this market. There are some other platforms around. I, I just kind of wonder how much the telco is really going to kind of make from it. And mm. I think you know, we're not being told anything about the pricing arrangements or the revenue sharing arrangements. That's a really odd thing with this. It's not something you can easily look yeah. at and say, well, this is how big the market right. is. You, you know, someone like buys a mobile phone product and there's one subscriber and you add more, you can work out what's happening. Whereas this is all a little bit opaque and no yeah. one really knows what's going on behind the scenes. So, and we'll start to presumably yeah. see something in financials, but I, I just wonder how substantial it's going to be. You the know, the market process could kill this because yeah. the telco sales force and the Amazon sales force are both going to be wanting to take credit for a sale that relates to edge computing. Right. So yeah. how do they prevent uh, these two factions from killing themselves or throwing the other under the bus in order yeah. to get the credit for the sale? So this office politics are going to be a big player. Yeah, because you always get this lovely little, oh, it's great to work in partnership with this incredibly inspiring company. But then behind the scenes, <laughs> you know, people are on bonuses, people are on variable, yeah. you know, they're going to be jostling and elbowing for a bigger piece of the action. That was one of the chats we were having uh, with one analyst, um, I probably could mention it, but I won't, because it's not in the room. What uh, you mean? Uh, was, Dave, what does it rhyme with? Was it in the buffet line? Dave Davison. It was in the yeah. It was in the coffee oh, break. So I think that's still... Steve Stevens. <laughs> yeah, it's Steve, Steve and it was, Dave. It was a different, it was a different one from Steve. Um, and but about like I think that the metaphor <laughs> I use, I know, we're tying ourselves in knots here. <laughs> Everyone's called Dave, all right. Um, was the metaphor I used was letting the fox into the hen house. Yeah. So you you know you partner with someone like AWS on edge computing, 
and you're basically letting some a company that's obviously one of the biggest companies in the world that's expert at cloud mm. um, into this little space that to some sort of hardware wise and in a lot of ways that you thought was your space and you're letting yeah. them in and then they'll go okay thanks it's great to partner with you and then how do you like five years down the line they might be doing about well, 90 percent of it and just giving you a little kickback but then they've taken over it's a very kind of tangible way in which is that this is actually a bad thing for telcos in a way because they've obviously there's a company called mobile edge x which is also in this middleware uh, area where they're trying to basically provide a software platform that started you put at the edge. Telco. It was yeah. started by a telco. You know, they clearly wanted, there was some, um, it's Deutsche Telekom backs Mobile Edge X, but there's also SK Telecom has been interested in it. I think Telefonica has had some interest. Yeah. And Deutsche Telekom has always said, we want to try and make this something that other telcos invest in. It's going to be their platform. It's going to become the industry standard. And obviously if they had telco investors, they're going to be making some money out of it. So, right. and this, deal that AWS has done with not just Verizon but Vodafone, is it KDDI? Yeah. And, and SK I mean, Telecom. There's a major operator. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's pretty bad for Mobile Edge X and it's not great for some of the other platforms around as well that aren't, that aren't sort of showing signs of traction in the same way that the big cloud players are. Yeah, it turns out the, the industry standard was already there. And, yeah. Uh, Next thing you know, they'll be wanting to just, buy just need tailoring. To, <laughs> so it's called wavelength, isn't it, to get the name right? And the it's uh, the, the at AWS thing. Devices. Yeah. Yeah. But they, yeah. now, they now have that. They have something called Outpost, as far as I understand, which is more about putting stuff actually on a premise. That's right. interesting. Um, That's solving yeah. that whole hybrid cloud computing thing. Yeah. So it's just like taking the exact same software and IT stack that they use in their own cloud, putting it on your premises, and then having making sure that the two can talk to one another, replicate information when they need to, and that sort of thing. Yeah. And it, it blows apart this whole... Uh, sort of middleware area where a bunch of software companies were trying to compete with, oh, we can we can translate this cloud to that cloud, or we can make this as easy to use as this, and that sort of thing. And Amazon's like, well, we are the cloud, so yeah. we'll, we'll just do it for mm. you. Yeah, and I, and I think with, because um, I remember talking to telcos a few months ago when there was a bit of noise about Mobile Edgex and saying, you know, what, what do you think of it? And they were like, well, yeah, we're looking at it, but we're also sort of in, in discussions with people like Amazon and these guys. and. You know, what's probably swayed it for them, I guess, is just this is a hyperscale cloud provider that has a huge yeah. developer community behind it already, and it's got global yeah. scale, and, you know, Mobile Edge X is, all right, it's got some big backers, but in fairness, it's a pretty small kind of startup, isn't it, based in Silicon Valley, and yeah. it does, just doesn't, doesn't look as convincing, I'm guessing, next to some of it, next to... AWS. And maybe they end up doing both, I mean, you know, depending on what the application yeah, is. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I don't think it's, this is the other thing, is this, I mean, we were talking about this in the coffee break as well, about lock-in, you know, lock, yeah. being locked into one. With uh, Phil Philipson. With Phil Philipson, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's another um, great analyst. Does it, does it force you to kind of just use AWS, or can you introduce other platforms and run those alongside it and have, you know, sort of multiple middleware platforms that you're relying on? I don't really know the... I don't really know what no, the minutiae of it works. definitely gets too arcane for my dilettante um, knowledge. But it, my, I, I always, in my, if you could call it a career, um, like to play to my strengths and, and be a sort of keep it top line and simplified. <laughs> and uh, and what I take from it is just a sort of sus just a feeling that companies that are a bit shaky in this subject matter have partnered with a company that's that's absolutely got it nailed down. And it just feels like sort of men amongst boys, um, yeah. but but we'll see. I mean, it, it should be mutually beneficial. Even Amazon's got to realise, you know, going back to you know, I don't know, people who talk about deals. I hesitate to mention your esteemed president, but he wrote that book, <laughs> The Art of the Deal, didn't he? I mean, it's not my president. <laughs> <laughs> Damn right. Um, but he, uh, but but people who talk about deals um, say that it, it needs to be, you know, it's cliche. It needs to be a win-win. They mm. can't be. You know, one party can't feel that they got absolutely screwed over. Right. Yeah. So, so even if Amazon could, they'd be smart to, to um, keep the balance right. Well, and to take it from Amazon's point of view, I don't think they have a real appetite to get into uh, connectivity infrastructure at all. Um, I, I think they like the fact that they know IT really well and they know um, how to pro provide and provision services inexpensively over the cloud. I just, I mean, I'm sure they own dark fiber for various reasons, yeah. but, you It'd know. It'd be mainly for, like, data center stuff. Yeah, the wholesaler uh, telecom community, they sort of uh, 
privately wonder at what point Amazon will start um, providing its own dark fiber services between its locations because right now it's easier for them to simply buy from telecom wholesalers. And I, it, that tells yeah. me that they're still not very interested in becoming no. a telco. And that would be very sensible. Unless, before I move this on, because we've got an Austrian restaurant to go to and eat, <laughs> eat our own weight in schnitzel. Oh, good. Um, which, which in my case is a considerable amount of schnitzel. <laughs> I'm going to eat eats um, done that today. <laughs> Yeah, I know. They served up... Um, this definitely isn't Chatham House Halls. They served up... We had a coffee break. <laughs> the schnitzels. On yeah. The we had a call. coffee break. You know, like the afternoon the coffee break. Yeah. You expected a few little pastries and no. Austrian delicacies. They were whacking schnitzel and Jeez. meatloaf out. Yeah, Austrian Pierre, meatloaf. Yeah, you, you took care spam. of a whole slab of meatloaf, didn't you? This is like... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, this this is like this is like being at, at a, a, going to a, a telecom conference at grandmother's house. You know? it's like every <laughs> yeah, time I turn eat, eat, right. eat. Yeah. I know. Um, anyway, sorry, I digress. Um, one last thing I want to say about Amazon and the general subject of core competency. So, around about sort of five and a half years ago, when I started this job, having previously been a smartphone analyst, Amazon launched a smartphone called the Fire Phone. Never heard. And, of it. Yeah. Well, there's a good reason for that. <laughs> um, and, and I basically wrote a piece going, it's um, right. And the reason it was, was it was, it was high spec mm -hmm. and thus high priced, but it used an Android fork. Mm. So you didn't have the full Amazon Android experience. And, right. you know, and it was clear to me at the time that that would never work, and it didn't work. And basically, they ended up with about a million um, paperweights. So Amazon's just as capable of asking things up when it goes out of its core competency as anyone else. So, yes. Yeah. That's to sort of further agree with your point. Okay, so so talking, maybe this is a forced segue, but talking mm -hmm. about core competencies, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of big operator groups, or at least a couple, you, you reminded me there's, uh, there's one more, um, have had a great big sort of, this is our, our cunning new strategy yeah. announcements in the last couple of weeks. There was Telefonica last week, and there was Orange that um, you and Jamie were writing about today. Yeah. So why don't you? And then I think there's, there's MTS as well. Yeah. Yeah. So why don't you just give us the sort of lowdown on on these? On yeah, these it's like, plans. Well, I suppose they have capital markets days, don't they? Every few years when they update on their on their strategy, and I, I guess all of them are kind of come to the end of a, a, of, a, of, a of a cycle. So they, <clears> they they then have to sort of tell investors what they're going to do, and right. Some aspects of the plans are more. I mean, there's there's they things that aren't a huge surprise, stock. and there's some that yeah, yeah there's or at so least they, convince people there is a plan at but all. But the thing that I would say unites them all is actually getting back to something we were talking about at the start, which is um, diversification, right? And you know, talking <clears throat> going into sort of parallel opportunities or adjacent markets. So things like so banking, for instance, is a really big deal for both Orange and MTS, and that's something both of them plan on focusing on more. As part of these these sort of updates to their plans, I think Orange is talking about launching. It's already got, got a banking operation in France, but it's now planning on launching that across the whole of Europe. Um, MTS is is offering banking services in Russia and wants to sort of generate more from that in the future. Thank God, I was about to get them confused with MTN. Yeah, and then and then you Telefonic is very me much, out there, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Telefonic is very much focused on um, things like cybersecurity and, and IoT, and has actually set up a new division. I'm going to get the name wrong, but I think it's Telefonica Data, where they're using data analytics to basically you know, expand their cybersecurity offerings and, and do more in the way of um, IoT. And that's... Yeah, actually, they like a bit of AI, don't they? That's, yeah, they, yeah, they like a bit of AI, and that's growing really fast. So that's... They won an AI award at this year's telecoms.com awards. Yeah. But they, those are the... I would say those are the things that unite all th all through the plans. It's it's kind of stuff that they're planning on, opportunities that they see beyond just the standard telco mm. stuff. And then, as besides all of that, you've got sort of various restructuring initiatives going on. So can't be a restructure. Um, one thing that a we lot do of, that we do that at telecoms at com every now and then. Yeah, one, but one th one thing a lot of European operators are struggling with is um, just trying to make the numbers add up when it comes to building out five G networks, and they're obviously in very competitive markets compared to. The North American operators, they're, they're much more heavily regulated, so yeah. and they've been spending a lot of money on, on spectrum licenses. And so a, a component of these these plans that you see, certainly from Telefonica and Orange, is um, doing things like spinning off their towers into yeah. separate units and going more down that sort of road of infrastructure sharing. So one of the things that... I didn't focus on it much in my story, but uh, one of the things that came out of Orange's update today were plans on even on now sharing fibre networks in France. Right. You know, they've talked about sharing... 
the radio networks, but they're even talking about spinning off, potentially spinning off fibre and sharing right, so that everything with, to the share, physical share infrastructure, public infrastructure sector. becomes a joint. Yeah, so the whole thing becomes, you know, they, they're just taking more of a services role. And and and, um, and it seems to it seems to stem from the fact that they just haven't got the cash. Yeah, they. they I mean, if they, they had the cash, to, they obviously wouldn't get other stakeholders involved, would they? Yeah, I mean, if you look at like. Deutsche Telekom, for instance, which had its own, um, it didn't have a strategy update in the same way, but it had its own sort of financials coming out recently, and their, their, their debts have gone up, and Vodafone as well, you know, they've had sort of big increase in debt because of spending on spectrum licenses right. combined with takeover activity. Yeah. So they all of a sudden find, and their revenues aren't, inc- their revenues are just flat, so they all of, all of a sudden find themselves having to build out these very expensive 5G networks, which are going to require and they got intensification. Mm. They, yeah. you know, they're highly leveraged already, so they have to find ways of, of, of doing that economically and, and sharing your sharing your towers is big and this is something mm. they wouldn't have been the, the interesting thing is years ago if you go back 10 years they the idea of sharing active network equipment wouldn't have been on the agenda they'd all, they'd all have said no it will make differentiation awkward yeah. and um, you know oppose you know, we, we lose control over what we can do you know we get tied to the same vendors potentially but they've sort of been forced down that road they're now having to justify doing that but they they don't really have any other options um, yeah, because so, because they're out of cash. Yeah, and that and that in turn then puts pressure on them, I guess, to to come up with some kind of compelling growth story. So this yeah. is why this is why there's all this stuff about yeah, let's let's go down the road of, let's get into banking, let's yeah. get into, the one the one I think on, on that front is maybe more interesting than the others is is perhaps MTS because they they're in a, a very big market and it's. Um, less penetrated by the big US tech companies. So they don't have the kind of competition that you see from Facebook and Google and, and Amazon. And there's all these sort of local language issues and, and local tastes. And it, it, it's very similar to what happened in Turkey, where Turkcell kind of has done really, really well on diversification and going into some of the opportunities where we say... Partly because it's Telcos a greenfield don't, field don't situation really for... Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they just don't have the same kind of pressure from the big web giants and, and it's just built like its own social media it's got its, its own social media yeah. platform it's got um it's done quite a good job of getting into systems integration right i yeah. mean the, the revenues are still from some of these other services they're doing in ticketing and entertainment they're still quite low i think and right. most of it comes from banking and systems integration but you can certainly see that there's an opportunity there they they tell quite a good story about why it makes sense compared with say vodafone trying to do it in the uk where you, you sort of go that, i don't get that at all yeah I got one other thought about the the sort of narrative that big companies try and spin on these sort of reorgs and this new five year cunning plan. It seems to it seems to adopt a certain quite formulaic structure, which is part A is definitely really focusing on our core stuff. Oh, yeah. They're really worried about any diversification narrative in any way um, giving the impression that um, that they're not that they're in any way taking their eye off the ball of their cash cow, their core business, all that sort of thing. So, yeah, definitely double down on that. We're all into that, totally. Yeah. And then the second one is, but diversification, we can do a bit of this, a bit of that, and the other. It's almost like, you know, when Google created Alphabet? Yeah. To 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 sort of create a uh, like a firewall between core Google and the moonshot yeah. bit. Right. It's, almost, it's almost like they're doing that. And then, um, and then there's... Uh, and one other bit, which which you didn't mention, which I thought was interesting, certainly in one of them, if not both, Orange was banging on about sustainability quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. So an in- increasing pillar of, uh, you know, certainly big public companies is to talk about sort of corporate responsibility. Now, I'm very sceptical about it, not not because I don't think that people should sort of do the right thing, but I just don't think I don't don't think corporates have morals. No. I think you know they're there to serve their shareholders. So when they start claiming to have a corporate morality, that it's just a sort of checkbox exercise, as far as I'm concerned. But that's increasingly coming up in these. Things. I think it's to make you know um, retired teachers feel good about their pension fund investing in the companies. Like I, yeah. I, I don't. I think it's just high high tone PR. I don't. I yeah. don't think there's anything to it because, like you said, the the real. I mean, not to say that you know. I mean, look, the Earth is actually on fire right now. But, yeah. Um, the the problem. You're not wrong. Yeah, we got to go. <laughs> no, <laughs> the, uh, the but the problem with that is that you know trying to take that morality and infuse it and make it work into a corporate strategy. Yeah. Look, it, if you want to save money by using LED lights, 
then just do that and shut up about it. Do you know what I mean? You Don't stick I mean? Greta Thunberg on the board right. and expect us to give you a big pat on the back. <laughs> there, there might be a business reason for doing it. Yeah. Yes, well, quite. Well, I mean, that's and, the point I think we're making. Yeah, There's a good yeah, business yeah. reason. Yeah, and, oh, I yeah. see. You're saying, like, in terms of sustainability, cutting down I'm not, on overheads I'm not, I'm not, and that sort of thing. I'm not entirely thing. cynical about it because I, I don't think they Just want be to be green business. for the sake of being green. Yeah. But I think they right. might feel that they need to be green because... Yeah. Because some of the executives share some of these concerns well, on the one hand, but there's also pressure. There's a lot of public sector, pre- public sector, just public pressure on them at the moment uh, right. to to show that they're doing something. And companies that are exposed as being, you know, uh, as, as disregarding the issue or not making any effort at all when they're actually big sort of carbon emitters. Are no, good point. It's a balance. Well. If they can't so, just come out and go, you know, what, we don't give. A you know, you know, a a f- a, has a powered site in Birmingham now it's entirely powered by human waste I think. is it yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they talked about it over dinner recently which is so great, they, a great, so a great, fantastic a great evening to bring so, it up so they, they do give it and they, they literally give it there's a site in Birmingham that is Actually, get your beeper out shit. someone else did <laughs> <laughs> what's it called it's like uh, oh, there's, a, there's a proper word for it it's not powered but that's basically uh, what it is yeah. oh really it's not that's not the word <laughs> that's, not, that's, not the, that's not the expression they use in the, Bio- in the corporate <laughs> sustainability report Bio- Bio- that's it biomass Bio- 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 oh, yeah. <laughs> no i mean yeah obviously if it makes sense within if it makes sense within the parameters of the company itself that's one thing but if it's a sort of corporate Virtue signal exercise, then I think it deserves to be called out as such. That's all. Yeah, it's just. But I think we should nice. definitely be writing more about powered sites <laughs> in the future. <laughs> or just keep saying it so that Pierre is sure he's going <laughs> to miss at least one or two with his little bleeper. Um, but that's all fine. Listen. Yeah, um, it bleeps out. Uh-huh. Well, yeah, I, well, when when I, I mean, there's certain words which I won't the ones be, that Jamie uses. I won't be such an idiot as to say now no. that Pierre, we definitely have to be. To be honest, there's an ongoing discussion <laughs> about. Borderline words. Anyway, right. I'll let Pierre's the <laughs> Pierre's the boss on that one. Okay, um, we're heading off in about uh, half an hour, so we better wrap it up. You didn't have anything to add. I didn't really give you much nope, of a chance on that. That's one. that's it. Okay. Well, look, it's great to have you on again. This is a Thanks. once a year thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'll see you next year. Um, and uh, right. great event as ever. Thanks. And thank you both guys. And thank you for watching. Make sure you join us for the next one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>